Hello, and welcome to the 80th Texpressionism Artist Salon. I'm Renata Januszewska, and I'm coming to you today from the village of Lion's Head in Ontario, Canada. Our topic today is money. Our first presenting artist is Susan Detroit. Susan is a mixed media artist who lives and practices in Eugene, Oregon. And so Susan, over to you. Hi. Um, yes, I'm in Oregon in the United States, Northwest part of the United States. And I created a, a keynote and I, so I'm gonna share my screen and um, attempt to do that. So. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? It says artist money. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and anyone um, that is not Susan, if you could please mute yourself, that'd be appreciated. Okay. So um, I created a, a keynote and um, I'm going to start that. Um, when I started, when I, I'm going to also time myself. Um, when I started thinking about artists, uh, who I am as an artist and money, I came up with this idea, and um, which is I wanted to share with you all the ways that I have supported myself as an artist over the years. And um, my presentation will be about uh, 10 minutes, and I'm going to go through those. And what I did is I sat down and I started a list. And unbelievably these to me this seems like a lot i came up with these this list of jobs or ways that i created income over the years of being an artist um in the beginning so to speak of my career i had jobs reg regular jobs for a number of years uh during the day day jobs most of them were part-time. Occasionally there was a full-time job, but at the same time, I was doing side jobs um, to and, and my artwork. And these are all of the jobs that I've done over my uh, lifetime career as an artist. Once I decided to stop doing almost full-time uh, work jobs. I made a decision like about in the 90s that I was an artist. <laughs> I decided I was an artist in the early 90s. I was no longer going to do a job that wasn't related to art. So um, in the beginning of my art career, I was a photographer and I uh, worked for bands. I did professional photography for um, uh, friends of mine and people that re were referred to me. I did ton of portrait photography. I did weddings a little bit. I found them very difficult. And I had, uh, this is a picture of a woman named Lori McLean who hired me a lot. Um, she was a pro um, financial manager. Uh, I also did contracted work. And this is where my photography um, so got reinforced. Uh, I was doing projects for the local transit district called Lane Transit District. And these are some of the pieces that I did for their transit guide. Not, um, I did some kind of interpretive work in, and they used it, which, which I was happy about. Uh, also when in the beginning of my career, I was, uh, doing installations at community colleges in Eugene and other small at uh, Corvallis, which is where Oregon State University and also in Salem, Oregon, there were some projects there. 
um, yeah. One of the two of the, two of the places that I've worked of, that I worked for a long time was uh, the two of them were one was called the Jacobs Gallery was a pretty well known um, in Lane County, Oregon, well known uh, gallery. I was the manager and exhibit designer, and I got started in that work because. Um, I had been a photographer and uh, I was an analog photographer and digital started happening. And I was <laughs> at the time totally angry and didn't want to have anything to do with digital. So I, and I'd had uh, cancer. And when I came back from cancer treatment, digital had taken over photography. So I started volunteering at the Jacobs Gallery and that turned into a very long-term job. And I also worked at the same time at the PRN galleries uh, for Peace Health, which is a medical, uh, a huge medical organization. Um, I also did teaching. Um, I've done that on and off my whole career, um, primarily with my digital camera work and, um, but also teaching um, more recently, uh, tea bag art paper uh, usage and, and also transfers. I was teaching transfer work. One of the galleries I worked for that was probably one of the ones that was one was the one that I liked the most was the David Joyce Gallery at Lane Community College. I worked there about seven or eight years. And as, as I mentioned, these were not full-time jobs. They were sick. Um, they were on a cycle because when the uh, when a show would come up, I'd prepare and and do the call, and I worked there um, for a number of years. David Joyce was a beloved uh, instructor, and he passed away. And this gallery was named for him. He was someone that I knew personally and had taken classes from, and I liked that job quite a bit. Um, and the gallery eventually was. Um, uh, no longer happened, <laughs> no longer was funded, so it stopped. Uh, I also did specialty medical projects where I helped uh, create this wall at the Neal Intensive Care Unit in um, at Peace Health in Springfield, Oregon. This was also a very much loved job. I worked with a number of parents and we created all of these pictures of children that had been in the NICU and were now, of course, thriving. I briefly worked at Copic Marker in uh, Eugene as the trade show manager. Um, this was a very interesting job and I'm not gonna go into it, but it was bumpy. It was a bumpy organization and eventually I was let go. Um, but I'm not going to go into all that, but I will gladly talk about it when I'm not doing this whole this uh, presentation. Uh, for a number of years, up until right before COVID, I worked for Dave Imus, who was uh, who is an incredibly talented cart cartographer. He makes um, by it makes these beautiful maps, um, and we worked together for several years. I've always done art sales. Um, the pieces, the the piece in the middle is from my early series called Mythic Animals. The piece on the right is from my series called uh, Worship of Precious, and it's a uh, piece of cactus work and transfers. The piece in the middle is from the period when I was um, uh, had survived cancer treatment and. Um, these pieces came to me in a sort of a dream state. And then the piece on the left is, uh, those pieces on the left are from my Portrait of a Woman project. And that's a metal print that person, um, this person is purchasing. And I wanted to just I, uh, tribute to the people in my life who have bought art for me a lot and supported my art career. Um, these. The people, the women here have bought for me multiple times and I certainly appreciate them. And mostly, yes, that's, those are all from the Portrait of a Women series that I uh, started creating before COVID. Of course, um, many of you have done 
annual holiday sales. I did studio sales. I did fundraiser sales. Um, I was part of a holiday art show at the Whitaker Printmakers for many years. Um, and this, that of course was before COVID and all of that stopped. Um, and I have a converted uh, garage from which I did open house and annual sales. Uh, and that was the picture on the bottom left is when I was doing the mythic animal pieces and I had a sale there. Okay. Always I've been creating art cards and almost all the series I've ever created, I've made art cards. Um, the ones that are in the background are the cards that I'm creating now that I sell at a local um, shop, not a few blocks from me. And whenever I show that work, I also have cards available. I currently have a piece that's showing in a group show and I uh, have cards. The cards uh, have been one of the more popular ways uh, that people have accessed my art. And I also use those on a Patreon page. People can order those. A few years, uh, at, in 2019, I created a book, um, a, a couple books. I had a request from a counselor to create a book for her uh, sort of self-image counseling uh, clients. And that book is still available. Uh, Yes, I did NFTs for a while with the roses. Um, I'm not doing that now, but that work helped me create other work, digital work and films. Um, oh, in the, I think uh, mostly right, uh, starting during COVID I've done films and uh, I was commissioned to do a film, a 40 day documentary film um, and uh, I also won an award, have won awards for my baking films, uh, monetary, some money, yes. And the last slide is of collaged compositive pieces that I've made over the years um, since starting digital work. Primarily those are pieces that, uh, individuals want to do that have to do with people that are either passed away or are aging and uh, are expected to die, except for the pet. <laughs> but um, I did a number of those and the piece uh, that you see on the right, some of you will recognize Cynthia Beth Rubin actually helped me um, get some high res resolution piece. And that I just, finished yesterday for one of the people that was uh, for one of the supporters and she's totally loves it. And so we're gonna look at that. And so that brings us up to now. And I think that's the end of my presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Sure. Uh, thanks for sharing all that long art journey that you've had. <laughs> Thank and, you. Are we well, doing questions or are we just going to go? Or, um, or how are we? The way we're going to go is uh, there are two more presenters coming okay. up and then we'll open it up and people can certainly cool. ask questions. So yeah, thanks. Uh, you're welcome. Um, the next presenter is Colin. Hey, what's up? Thanks, Renata. Um, and thank you, Susan, for your uh, presentation. Um, so yeah, I mean, this topic wasn't something that I really thought I had anything to share about. But um, as I was uh, doing this um, inventory of mine, uh, I have uh, been pulling out lots of old work and photographing the stuff that I hadn't photographed. And I came across a bunch of work from graduate school that actually has money in it. Um, so I thought I'd share that work and, uh, you know, um, just do a little show and tell. So let me uh, try sharing my screen here. 
Okay. Can you guys see my screen okay? Desktop. Yes. Okay. So these pieces are, um, there's four of them and they're pigment transfers that were done in 2005. Um, so the pigment transfer is basically a process where you print onto a transparency film with an inkjet and then um, use a specialized primer that this particular primer um, it, it was sort of mixed with rubbing alcohol or isopropyl alcohol and then applied to wood panels. And then the um, transparency film is sort of rolled down across the substrate and burnished, you know, to work out any air bubbles. And then when you peel the, um, the transparency film off, it actually transfers the pigment, pigment from the film to the substrate. So it essentially will transfer the pigment directly onto, you know, a surface that you couldn't ordinarily run through a printer, like a piece of plywood, for instance. Um, so these pieces were done um, as part of a, a mixed media, digital mixed media class that I audited. It was actually an undergraduate class that I sat in on. And um, it was actually a really great class because I learned a lot of different techniques um, around digital mixed media. And uh, there are a couple books on Amazon. Like if you search digital mixed media, there are two female artists, um, Bonnie Lotke, Lotka is one of them. It's L-H-O-T-K-E, I think is her last name. Um, there's another artist too that also, um, you know, another female artist, I think they might've co-authored a couple books on the subject, but they went through a few different, um, you know, techniques in the book. And then we learned them in the class. Uh, one of the... Um, the vendors that I've used, and I think this was the company that made this um, film and primer is called DASS, D-A-S-S, -S, which is like digital art supply, something or other. And um, I remember the primer is called Super Sauce, which is kind of like, it looks like almost like a, a gesso. I think I actually have a jar of it kicking around somewhere. Um, I don't know, maybe that's something else, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's another company called Inkaid that uh, I believe they make similar similar products and they make a primer that I use quite a bit to print, to run inkjet um, prints on different surfaces. So anyway, um, that's a little bit about the process. The photographs were taken with a Palm Trio, which uh, was sort of a pre-iPhone smartphone, looked like a Palm Pilot with a little keyboard on it. And... Um, you know, being the sort of nerd that I am, as soon as there was a phone with a keyboard, I was all over it. And there was even a little modem that you could plug into it so you could access a very small amount of content. Um, I think it was really actually just email at that point. Um, this is, uh, geez, it must have been 1997 or eight that that smartphone came out. Um, and then that was before the sort of iPhone form factor of, you know, a flat screen with no keyboards or buttons on it. So the, the photos are very low resolution and they were taken inside of a supermarket. I believe it was called Kroger, which is in the Midwest. I went to um, grad school in Ohio and uh, there were two of them actually in Bowling Green, Ohio, where I went and actually met Patrick Lichty in that program there. We're both um, MFA computer arts students at that school. And there was um, a Kroger and then there was a Meyer that was M-E-I-J-E-R. And those were the two supermarkets, neither one of which I have, they're, they're here on the East Coast. I'm zooming in from uh, Vermont on the in the Northeast part of the country of the US. Um, so yeah, these pictures were taken in the supermarket. I'm not exactly sure why uh, I took them. You know, I wasn't consciously um, trying to make any work about commerce or consumerism, but the supermarkets were just like giant. And um, actually, you know what? I think these were taken in a super Walmart now that I'm actually looking at the pictures. Um, because so this one here is called, um, let me just see these titles are uh oh geez um meat 225 so i guess it was 225 a pound and then there's a barcode in here and there's resin on top of the uh 
the piece and I poured the resin over these, um, I think they're quarters or are they, they're nickels. Yeah. So I mounted those, I glued them onto the wood and then I poured resin over the top of it. Um, this one is another one that was, yeah, I'm almost positive. This was in like a super Walmart because there was food and clothing in there. Um, this one's called Andy would approve in reference to Andy Warhol, um, who was sort of very interested in the idea of consumerism as a topic. Um, and, you know, I just, I had never been in a super Walmart before I went out to Ohio and it was just really kind of wild to be in a store where there was clothing and meat, um, in the same store, you know, along with pretty much everything else that you could imagine. Um, so that's kind of what drove me to, uh, create these pieces. This one is called leave 80 cents and couple. Um, so there's 80 cents in this couple walking down the aisle getting their groceries um and this one i think is called dairy aisle um and you could see like in these pictures there's some artifacts of where i peeled the film off and it like ripped the pigment off um different spots and you know honestly i didn't mind that i think you know a lot of times it's kind of like that whole wabi-sabi thing where you know the imperfections are part of the art and that is what helps make it something other than a straight photograph. And I kind of like that. So, so those are the, the four pieces that I wanted to show and I'll actually, I'll show them really quickly um, in real life, quote unquote, cause I pulled them out so you could sort of see what they actually look like. So this one is the 80 cents and couple, and you could kind of see there's a very high gloss finish on it. And what I did was I, put a wood mounting block on the back. So when it's hung, you know, it sort of projects off the wall like an inch or so. And I kind of like that, um, you know, that, that type of presentation, this is, uh, yeah, there's two more that I have the, the meat 225. I, I don't know what happened to that piece, but, um, this is the Andy would approve one. And then this is the dairy aisle. So, um, yeah, that's <laughs> what I wanted to show. And um, that's that's pretty much it. You know, I was going to show some um, screen sharing of oh, actually there's one thing I, I did want to show. So uh, let me just see um, on the screen share. Yeah, so, um, you know, I just pulled up a few of Warhol's money related works. Um, these ones, you know, I'm not really feeling too much, but the ones that are actually the dollar bills, I thought just, they're very interesting. Um, just the whole idea of that, you know, and, um, about as anti-aesthetic as, as you can get, I think, which is what makes his work kind of interesting. You know, the, uh, the car crashes and, um, the electric chairs. I mean, some of those pieces in person are very powerful, um, you know, and I, they're difficult to appreciate. Uh, seeing them in reproduction so um so yeah that's that's all for me uh meat at 225 a pound that's <laughs> something something notable thank you very much colin um, you're welcome now, now i'd like to introduce two or one speaker from um mauna Mauna is the Museum of Wild and Newfangled Art. And some of you may have already met Carrie Ann and Joey at the last salon. But one of their mandates of the museum is that artists should be paid and paid well. So, with that little introduction, I'm going to ask either Joey or Carrie Ann to speak, please. Thank you so much, Renata. I'll start um, and give a brief chat and then Joey will follow up. And thank you, Renata and Colin for inviting us here. So I'm in New York City and on the homeland of the Lenape Ho King and going to share my screen. Mm 
maybe not. Um, I have a new computer, so <laughs> it's uh, an NYU computer and it's not letting me share my screen. So I'm just going to talk to you. Uh, I'm coming at this from the experience of an artist who's worked freelance for 20 years and uh, before landing a job in academia at NYU to balance out my finances. And this whole experience led me to question the art world in general. Uh, why is the artist paying for everything? Uh, why is the art world not sustainable? Why are artists buying into the star economy on Instagram uh, and other social media platforms and giving their art away only to be manipulated by algorithms, advertisement, and have their data farmed? The poaching of the artist has long been going on. So we created MANA, the Museum of Wild and Newfangled Art. When we created it, it was our mission to pay artists and to create an ethical business model and platform. Uh, we are committed to free calls for submissions, so we don't charge artists to submit their work to us. Uh, we sell work for the artist. We give 70-30 splits where the artist gets 70% uh versus the 50 50 of the normal traditional gallery setting we use nfts as a vehicle for payment and we see art as digital currency um with the rise of cryptocurrencies and the decentralization of money uh to layer art on top of the blockchain is revolutionary artists and the art market are seeing a huge transformation. The ability to sell one's art online worldwide to a market of artists, art collectors, and investors from the comfort of one's couch is radical. To do so with royalties that are paid on every resale of the token is exponential. We see this as the financial future for artists and as a way of um, also conservation, uh, archival, and a comfortable livability for artists. Not only can you invest in artists and their artwork and own works by traditional artists that you may never have been able to afford prior to the blockchain, such as Lorna Mills and Marina Abrovamik, uh, artists are now making tokens that one can purchase so that you can invest directly into the artist and not even uh, the production of artwork is involved. You're literally giving the artist money for their token as a indication that you support them and their lifestyle and their career choice of being an artist. So... I'm going to hand it over to Joey, who will be able to share his screen and show some of the work we've been doing. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Karen. So that's kind of some of what the museum does. And uh, I'm just kind of going to go through some of the things that we've noticed over the last handful of months and years, uh, how different individuals as well as organizations are sort of approaching, um, you know, creating money and uh, such from their work and 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 so on. Um, so sort of the most common one for the artist is mint the artwork as the NFT and you can sell it. That sort of brought in a lot of people who um, were interested in short-term gains. So a lot of people buying the NFT and then uh, relisting it higher and sort of seeing immediate sales there. Um, Another approach that the museum takes is sort of a longer term listing. So we'll buy work and we believe in the long term of the art space of the kind of blockchains as well as the artists. So we'll list works, but they're quite uh, substantially higher, um, hundred times, thousand times the price of what we purchased. Uh, part of it, the work we see is just too cheap. And the other is we see it, um, just, just having a lot more value if an artist is pouring their entire career into something or months to create work and they're selling it for a few dollars, that doesn't necessarily make sense. So 
there's some opportunity in there, um, either short-term or long-term uh, reselling of work. Uh, another way to kind of make money is to build your own platforms. So there's all these different technologies. The generative art got really popular with Artblocks and FX Hash. Um, both of those platforms are have made a like reasonable amount of money through sales by taking a percentage. So you can kind of create your own um, organizations, websites, and platforms and uh, market those and get investment for those from VC or angel investors and go on and sell those. Um, another thing is collecting. So kind of in the traditional space, there are people who collect art. Some of it's to support the artist. Some of it's because they enjoy it. We're not here to talk about any of that. We're here to talk about money. So um, collecting can bring you money, but it can also waste you a lot as well. Uh, another thing that's a way to make money in the space is curation. So um, if you're a curator, you can come in and filter through all the different millions of digital artworks that are available. You can throw exhibitions, you can rent space, promote it, um, sell works as part of it. Uh, one platform that we curated for was Object One. It's O-B-J-K-T dot O-N-E. And they have an open call for curators. So if you get a list of artists together and you're able to provide um, the artwork to the platform, they're willing to kind of give you uh, a marketing opportunity to sell some of your work. Um, most of kind of pricing and who makes how much and what do you price things at and how do you be successful? How do you sell? How do you try to avoid not selling is kind of based on some of what you see in like traditional art market or traditional uh, business at all. So marketing is a big one. If you're already established, um, that's going to help out and so on. So like all the traditional sort of uh, ways you make money in other industries uh, apply. There's no kind of like secret place you can go to to just, you know, make tons of money and so on. You have to be thoughtful and um, maybe have a business plan or some kind of um, strategies and, and so on and try to execute them. Another thing too is the space can be risky. So some of those art tokens that Carrie was talking about, we bought a really small amount as the museum just to show support for the concept and for the artist. And in just five weeks, some of them, I just checked their down 75% and others are up 55% and then kind of others have stayed the same. So there's a lot of volatility, which if you're an investor, I, I personally like um, because uh, that's opportunity to make or lose a lot, which um, can be interesting to different people. Another approach instead of just artworks or these tokens is to write. So there's a platform called FX Hash that has articles uh, people have been writing kind of interesting articles related to mostly generative art or artificial intelligence. Um, and they'll sell them. They'll put a price on an article. So prior, it was a little bit hard to kind of sell your articles. And it's still hard. You need to like market it and so on. But some of those have sold on the secondary market for maybe $100 or $200, um, which is cool. It's great to see writing be appreciated in that way. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to just kind of write articles and sell it for that much. You need to market it and, and have interesting content. But people are working through how do you build new publishing ways in uh, Web3. So that can be uh, books. So Tashin put out a book on NFTs, which created a big buzz. They were working that for about two years. Uh, it's a hardcover book. It's It's 850, I think, for a copy and then there's certain artist versions that are $4,000 uh, per book. So that's kind of how a, a larger publisher is sort of approaching the space. Individuals are creating zines or creating PDFs um, and just kind of selling them on a variety of different platforms. And there's just platforms that need to be built. Um, so if anyone has a passion for publishing or whatever, there's like big opportunities um, in most of sort of the industries. Other things people are doing are working with the physical. So how do you kind of maybe sell a digital version and do you sell a physical work along with that? Uh, we brought a work the other day from an artist called Hugh Messi, who works with uh, stitch, like automated stitching and then combining those uh, stitches into like a video. And that artist is sending along uh, one of these like automated stitched uh, frames from that animation to collectors of that work. 
there was another artist, Anna Lucia and Phoebe Hess, that combined for creating a uh, scarf. So you go onto the platform, you feed in uh, audio content. It converts that audio content into a graphical design that's output onto a scarf. So you're creating uh, individual kind of generative fashion. Um, so fashion is, and uh, physicals are kind of an interesting area to explore. There's also the concept of like params and how, who is kind of the creator. So the artist can maybe create code that creates imagery. And then the collector can go in and tweak that to get an output that they're interested in. So if you're looking at something's going to hang on your wall and you really want to get in there and like dial it into just what you're looking for, uh, those kinds of concepts of um, artists and collector coming together to create work um, and, and how that kind of plays back and forth. Um, I guess if you look at the art world, you kind of look at the sort of traditional way in which work was sold prior. So with the digital, you don't have to worry about shipping or insurance. Um, there's less of an environmental concern. Uh, provenance too is like very important. All of the work on the blockchains are traceable. I think there's kind of a quote that says 40 to 50% of uh, art on the traditional market is uh, forgeries. So um, obviously there are different markets totally, but those are some of the concerns for the advantages that like a digital product has. And there's a lot of partnerships and branding. Um, big organizations are coming in. Even Walmart, which was mentioned earlier, they have their own kind of NFTs that they're working on. So everyone's been trying this for a handful of years. Um, and yeah, I'll just kind of end with uh, one interesting sort of use case. There's the vending machine project that happened a couple of years ago in New York City. So there was a physical vending machine and it had like NFTs in it and you'd put in a few dollars and get this like NFT out of the thing. And then you'd go online and claim it. That's kind of morphed over to a digital version. So there's a website vending NFTs and um, you go and you just kind of get a random NFT and different artists come in and collaborate. They provide different works for the machine and collectors come in and get like an interesting artwork from an artist. Um, so there's a lot of different ideas that are coming out and I just sort of wanted to throw a bunch of them in terms of how people are approaching this and trying to generate revenue and so on. So thank you for the time and uh, hope everyone's making money and not losing it, I suppose. Thank you very much both to Carrie Ann and Joey. And just uh, so you remember, the Mauna website was dropped into the chat by Carrie Ann, and they currently have an exhibition on right now called Exit Plan. You can access all of their shows through the portal on their website. Um, a, an artist who's made a different kind of token is Jan Swinburne. Jan lives in Toronto, Canada, and she's done a project that she calls part of an artist multiple series. So I'm going to hand it over to Jan. She's going to talk about that now. Thank you. Uh, Jen, are you okay there? Are you frozen? You're, or you're muted? Sometimes Jan has Wi-Fi issues, so we'll just maybe just wait 30 seconds or so and um, yeah, she, there she is. You're muted, Jen. Um, yeah, I have a presentation. I'll see if I can screen share. Um, desktop. Okay. And we'll go here. Just a second. Oops, 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 oops. Okay, you got that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, as part of the thinking about money and NFTs and whatnot, I was inspired to um, 
create an artist multiple um, that I refer to as a pocket sculpture, um, which is in the end a token. But uh, for those of you who don't know my work, I'll just run quickly through. Um, I create these uh, relief sculptures based uh, on my voice saying a word. And these two particular sculptures are, um, they're the word time. And my next step in the process is to uh, film those. So I have a digital arts project and let's see if there's no audio on this. And uh, I exhibit these and speaking of money so far, um, I generally try to apply to places that are submit to places that do pay artist fees in Canada. We have a, a system called CARFAC, which is our artist union and our uh, artist run centers and other organizations usually pay fees for exhibiting. And then, so moving on, um, I got these nickel plated uh, coins made from, I'll give you the base design here. And the concept of money is part of this. Um, they taught, it's time is, time was, was a, uh, I, well, a quote from James, uh, yeah, James Joyce and um, time is time was uh, and is no more, I believe is the full quote. So my work deals with sound and I looked at those concepts and then I actually produced these one coin. This is the two sides of the coin. And I just, gonna show you some pictures because I don't want to go in too many things, details here. I'll show you this book at the end. Um, it's called Money Value Art and it's all sorts of different essays by artists on that topic, including myself. Um, I did one on accessibility and uh, from a disability perspective, but a disability perspective is actually a broader perspective with the universal access for most people. So um, here we have the packaging and the coin and this card, and then uh, basically a creative poetic piece that touches on some of the themes that are, are contained within the coin. And I'll show you a couple more things. Okay, so the artist multiple for this talk, I wanted to talk about some of the themes around money on this. Um, art is currency is something we've just been talking about. And we've seen all the physical and different forms where it's currency and how we think about currency. I mean, there's money, money and hard facts of trying to make a living and survive, but there's also cultural currency, um, an exchange of values uh, and ideas. And um, I don't know, like we tend to separate the two and making this project sort of started looking at it. Um, and I know other artists have done this. They've made an entire career on, I believe it was bonds that were created and this person was selling and trading bonds. Um, so even when you comment on it, it, it can become something else. So it's it's just an interesting thing. My other interest in this it was the idea of distribution. And um, so far, I'm selling these for $25 US to people outside of Canada. And so far, they've found their way to various spots in Canada and North America. And I just really like that idea that it, it's a small thing that can actually it's financially fairly accessible to, you know, a lot of people, but obviously not everyone. Um, and it's actually going to be distributed around. And I really like that um, as, as a multiple, the idea of multiples. And then there's um, 
you know, the history of coins and legacy. And I have this sort of fantasy of, you know, like, I pass away and somebody finds my my coin cash, you know, if they're still around like 100 years from now and they dig it up. And, and uh, you know, I've also got some that were, they're malformed and they're not very good. And I'm, I'm thinking I'm just going to go and drop them in places around the city eventually after after I've sold enough of these particular things. I decided to do an open edition, um, again, sort of bucking against the trend of um, preciousness and value that, that happens in the market for this project. Obviously other things um, out of practical reasons you definitely want um, in a closed edition. But, you know, this also makes me think of my little felt postcard that was uh, Joseph Boyce, right, uh, at Multiple. And I love that thing, you know, it's, it's just such a nice, I feel like I have a little piece of Joseph Boyce that I could never, you know, afford or anything else. So, and um, accessibility too, it's like, you know, there's the financial accessibility, but there's also, you know, the physical object and, and someone who with low vision, you know, it's something they can hold. And those are things I try to consider in my artwork, um, you know, on a basis more regularly now than I used to. So that's kind of what I've been up to with this. And if you want to read the um, little explanation poem thing that goes with this, um, the content for me is very important with the, the messaging and the ideas of getting people to think about money and how we think about money is, you know, tied to, you know, time and wasting time or, you know, um, and money, money talks. That was the other thing that's a big piece of this work is, is the idea of voice and voicelessness and that it, one who has more money has more power and more voice. So it also touches on that theme as well in, in our particular system, as well as, you know, uh, just musical forms that aren't heard. So I think that's it for me. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. Yeah. So Thanks so much, Jen. I, I have to say that I'm really happy. We have two of yours in our family. And I'm just wondering, how do people get in touch with you if they would like to purchase one of okay. your tokens? Sure, you can um, get to, I'll put it in the chat, my website through my website or social media. Um, let me just see. Let me cut and paste them and I'll put them there for you. It's going to take me a minute. So if people want to chat. Sure. And I just want to say that they come really quickly. I got mine so soon <laughs> after. <laughs> to you. To you. Uh, <laughs> it's about 10 days to the States, uh, I found out. OK. Yeah. So, and you do you do shipping internationally to Europe and Asia? Uh, yes, yes. And Jan, when you paste it in, if you could just chime in and say the URL, that way people who are watching a recording on YouTube could sure. also, you know, access it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me just get my. Uh, of course, I can't find it now. While we wait a few minutes for Jan, I'm going to introduce the next speaker, which is who is Roz. And Roz has given a talk recently, which she's going to share some some news about. Before we get to Roz, how's it going there, Jan, with with your it, website? It's going to take me a minute. Sorry, guys, my tremor's acting up. Um, I'll tell you what, it's janswinburn.com for these uh, closed caption. And I will put it in the chat as soon as I can. And there's an E at the end of your name, at the end of Swinburne. Yes, there is. Okay. And Jan is J-A-N. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for that presentation, Jan. Thank you. Uh, Roz, you are the speaker. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, um, all of you. This has been really interesting. And uh, yeah, I think I may have to get some of that money. 
Um, okay, so uh, I recently, I didn't really prepare this for this, so I'm just going to kind of rush through this, but I, I recently um, did a presentation to Gail Levin's class at Baruch, um, and it was to her art marketing class. It was all about art and money, which is something that has been like a, a large part of my work and my thoughts. So uh, I'm going to go tr just try to share my screen here. Uh, I have the PowerPoint open. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, yes. Okay, good. So I'll just play from start. Um, so uh, what is money but value? I give you this in exchange for that. I'm kind of going pretty fast through this. Uh, like a banana, you know, it's so easy to sell a banana because, you know, the supply and demand, depending on how many bananas are needed in the world, scarcity, this kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, as an artist looking out, uh, this was early days, me, uh, looking at a painting, uh, I was like, you know, where does that fit in with being an artist? Um, it's, uh, it's hard to put a value on art. This is an early piece, 83, I love you, me too. Kind of media coming in all the way. I'm a painter and still am a painter working in digital media now. Uh, one of my earliest paintings in Atlanta, Georgia, I, I, I was always interested in money and, and I worked in temp jobs um, and just, uh, I was fascinated by, by uh, I don't know, just the whole milieu of it. And so, uh, and the ironies, and I did this painting, this is just a small crop of it, but this is an oil painting about 50 inches wide. And she's, I took a dollar and, and tore it up in her face and, and I stood in it and I put pennies and it's really, it's, it's called uh, the dollar bill early piece. Talent is great, but it's not enough. Here's some early paintings of mine. These are really large, like 60 by 30. Just uh, I'm talking to these students, so I'm, I'm using this today just to, it was a kind of longer uh, talk, but heart to heart in the city. These are all oil on canvas, um, and uh, media was getting in there. Tilly the Teller was a credit card at the time, and it's right in her heart there. Um, a lot of urban. Urban has always been a big influence. Um, saxophone player, going kind of fast. Everything has a price, uh, you know, Volkswagen to New York City had to be there, got in the bug, came up to New York City, and almost immediately things were getting, uh, you know, more electronic. Uh, uh, money, I don't know, I'm getting off of the money topic a little bit, but it was always there. I mean, for one thing, how to, I immediately got a job at Wertheim in the Pan Am building. Uh, you know, because I, I, I've always, I never like to put too much pressure on my work to have to be commodity. And yet we all go about that in a different way. So, you know, when people say, oh, have you made your living as an artist? Uh, I would say yes. I mean, especially after I got into digital. Um, but anyway, first solo show, I, I love to talk to young artists and kind of encourage them because, you know, they see these movies in New York about, you know, young actors and artists and they're like in this penthouse looking out over all of New York City. And this is the reality of it. This is my first apartment that was advertised as a garden apartment. This has something to do with money. And uh, this was the garden right here. I just took a picture that looked a lot like my apartment. Um, early in my apartment, which I could uh, take a bath and do my paintings and call my mother and sleep and cook without really moving more than five feet. It was in the Upper West Side. Uh, I think it was the only tenement apartment at the time, um, but it was uh, the oil burner was always catching on fire downstairs. and. But I was just loving this and working in an apartment. And it is to all about money because, you know, I was working uh, as a temp and coming home at night and on the weekends. And and it was exhilarating. And these are all my traffic lights. I was using my uh, these hairdresser tubes from a friend of mine who was a photographer and a hairdresser. And I love these. I wanted to get the immediacy of, of the city. Um, going kind of soon, go after every opportunity. I'm talking to young artists who are trying to figure out how to market. Uh, there was an advertisement for the first uh, for New York for artists who did images of New York City, and every single image of mine was all about New York City. So I applied, and my first show was at the um, at the middle of the um, the city government uh, house here. In, uh, I'm not thinking of the right name, but the city courthouse, not the courthouse, but you know where the mayor was and everything. It was a long hallway, and uh, I invited everybody, and I encourage everybody to know what you're doing. You know, I gave them my card and said, "Hey, join me for the show." First 1,033 days in Manhattan. Even this image, it's about money. It's about a guy working in a bank. I mean, the drudgery of it all, you know, that's a oil painting on my card. But um, leading to digital, but still about money. Um, I was still working at places, but 
going into digital, my paintings are getting more and more about pixels, which I didn't even know what they were, but uh, pixels were invading and I was still working in offices temp, always temp, and then going to Pearl Paint, you know, um, never permanent jobs or the permanent jobs would never last because I had to do my art. I'm sure all of you can relate to that. Um, big paintings still, um, information paintings, 10 years of information paintings going from Atlanta to New York before I, um, people were important. Oh, this was the guy who's my model for my Wall Street boys. Uh, again, they're squares. Uh, and it was all about the money with him. And I just found these funny guys like going down to make money and they, they all had their little Wall Street journals and they're like, let's go for it. And I was just, they're like these little monsters. Um, I still have some of these, but I sold quite a few of these. Um, just having shows off and on. Uh, choices. I wanted to paint what I wanted to paint, not the trends. Again, we're leading into digital. So uh, early digital, I went into digital, took the earliest courses at SVA, and I'm leading into money in terms of my own life. And that at a point, uh, I, I, I wanted to teach and I love to teach, but it, this, it's like 19, I started in 1984 in digital. And by the time, um, oh, here's my husband, four colors on an IBM. Um, I was ecstatic. The modern Odalisk, going fast. Uh, how much time do I have? That's why I'm going so fast. <laughs> I don't know. All right, so I'll just keep going. Uh, things were happening, at and uh, I'm, I'm starting to do digital work. And uh, one of the curators of at and I was telling these young artists, hey, go into any show you can, uh, you know, in the early days. And I'd had a show in New Jersey, and it turned out that the woman who lived around the block, Natalie Barkley Jones, was the curator for at and corporate collection. She saw one of my digital florals that I had output with Dugal's help. I mean, things were kind of primitive in the early days of digital. Uh, and she came over and bought eight pieces for the permanent, their permanent collection. Um, so um, I was on the cover of Al Gore racing down the information highway. I mean, he really was the, the information highway. And this was, um, some of you may remember Colin and others, but um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name who was in charge of this tabloid called Electronic Directions. And by then I was working at the World Trade Center and leading new media departments because it was kind of early to, I, I talked to Pratt about going, you know, going into to get my master's and they said you could teach half the courses for the master's. And um, I was already working in the late shift down at the World Trade Center. I seem to always be working there, which is of course the pinnacle of money. And for this particular, they asked me to do this cover and paid me. Um, and Al Gore has actually signed this piece. And I, I have three copies of this piece signed. Uh, but it's all these people pumping in the um, gym at the World Financial Center, which is pretty souped up. I mean, I was working in the heart of money. And whenever, and these jobs, when people say, oh, did you make your money as a professional artist? I say, hell yeah. I mean, you know, in the Renaissance, you didn't have to just be the one who was Michelangelo, but he worked with people on altarpieces and even for big commissions, there were ateliers where people worked together. And, you know, the separation of commercial and fine art, I mean, there certainly can be a difference. The cream rises to the top. There are great works that certainly exceed commodity. But I, I found working within, uh, you know, like Deloitte and the Wall Street Journal and American Express, I found that fascinating. I mean, I never learned about fonts at art school and um, I was a fine art major, but I found all that fantastic. And, and I think the digital arena now is bringing all that together. Uh, these are digital pieces, dead umbrellas. Uh, here is the epitome of money. I was making a really good salary at Deloitte. I led their first new media department. I was enjoying being kind of irreverent within the middle of a, a big corporation at the World Trade Center. And uh, I came home and at the night I was doing pieces like this. And this is called Washington Pig. And it is all about money. I mean, it's the dollar bill and it's Washington. And right in the middle of his eyes, it says for sale. Um, and you can find a lot of other references to money and to Noam, um, who am I thinking of? Um, Noam Chomsky, you know, it says uh, nothing is created equal. The consent to manufacture. There's just a lot of little jokes going on. And what's funny about this is that it's always these rich sort of no, I'm not a Republican, uh, types who have been collectors of mine who just love this piece. So it's a critique and it's a celebration of money. We've got Estee Lauder lipsticks. I had won a, a, um, an award, I can't remember what it's called, but it was one of the big ones for something I did with Estee Lauder, which was all about lipsticks, but we made it fun. I mean, I even tell students too, look, if you're working at a hardware store and you know, that's what you gotta do, you know, arrange the hammers in a way that's interesting. Yeah, you can bring art to anything. Um, but things were happening, uh, bigger shows, um, 
digital, you know, supporting the Guggenheim. And this was an early show, uh, pretty crowded. I was seven. Yes. Oh, am I way over? Okay. I got to do that. Thank, okay. thank you so much. I, I wanted okay. to leave some room for a discussion. Yes, I am just getting out of here. All right. Okay. At the end, I do want to say there's nothing better than being able to give a piece away. So there you go. The price of art is immeasurable. Thank you. I'm sorry. I hadn't planned this and I guess that's obvious, but I appreciate you letting me in here at the last minute. I just didn't have time. And, um, I, but I know my art is so much about money <laughs> that I just wanted to put this in there. Thank you. It was our pleasure. Thank you. I wanted to get back to uh, something that Carrie Ann said earlier, the, the question, why is the art world not sustainable? Or as Colin would say, the art industry. Any thoughts, anyone? I have a lot of thoughts about it, but I just talked for about 20 minutes. So maybe somebody else should. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about it too, especially as well, I hate to bring this up all the time, but I have to reference it. I'm in my eighth decade. And as a result of that, I have seen the art market go up and down several times and, and noted what caused these fluctuations. If we start with Jackson Pollock, um, that was when I was very young, but the adults that I was surrounded by questioned whether the crappy, cheap paint that he used to throw on the canvases was going to hold up over time. And in fact, when I was in Australia, Australia bought one of Jackson Pollock's biggest paintings called Blue Poles. And I asked the curator, and he said, oh, yeah, come on over. You'll find most of it on the floor. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, if you stand in here long enough, you'll hear a slight ping because little pieces of paint will just pop off the canvas and fall on the floor. <laughs> because it was he used mostly cheap house paint. Um, now, along with that, uh, acrylics started coming in at, in the 50s as well. And there was a huge argument about whether acrylics were going to last as long as oil paint does. And believe it or not, I actually still hear that conversation going on today. There are professors who will tell you, don't use acrylic paints because they won't hold up as much as oil paint. I've got acrylic paints here in my studio that I've owned since the late 50s, nothing has changed on them at all, not at all. Then when the uh, light and space movement came in and the Finnish fetish movement came in, uh, there was a big explosion with uh, plastics, um, using cast resin to make artworks with, which um, emitted fumes. <laughs> so, uh, collectors were a little leery about setting them in their living room or anywhere in their house if it was going to be putting out these dangerous fumes. Um, I went through a spell there where I was painting only on plexiglass with spray enamels. And boy, this stuff sold out like hotcakes at incredible prices. Um, and so far, luckily, none of those collectors have ever called me up and said, Lee, I have a problem with this piece. Um, but a good friend of mine, Peter Alexander, who casted sort of very high pyramid wedges out of resin, his pieces started doing this, <laughs> sort of slowly bending over. Um, it's the same problem that's going on with fiberglass uh, Corvettes. Um, the doors are all sagging on. Um, now, in the middle of all of that, I would meet curators and museum people. And they were scared to death of this stuff because they didn't have departments to deal with this stuff. They didn't know how to store it. They weren't sure whether it was going to hold up or not. And all of this filters down through the collectors. And the collectors start to question things like, can I buy this neon piece? And what happens when the gas inside the glass decays? The piece will change. The color won't look the same anymore. Do I get cheated? How can I resell it? All of this stuff comes up. Now, for a lot of you who are doing 
digital printing with archival pigment prints. <laughs> Ooh, that raises all sorts of questions uh, because we don't know the answer to that question yet, whether those pigments are going to survive or not. Are they going to decay? Are they going to start eating into the paper or whatever other surface you put them on? If you get out and mingle with collectors and are able to have discussions with them, one thing I can say that I found is consistent is the overwhelming majority of the very rich collectors, they don't give a damn. They really don't care whether that stuff's going to hold up or not. They'll buy it now because they can enjoy it now, show it off to their friends now, and later they'll donate it to some museum, and they'll, it'll be their job to take care of. To come down a scale to wealthy people, but people who are concerned about the legacy they're going to leave by giving this artwork to their family or relatives or donating it to a museum, those people I have found are very concerned about how stable the material you're using is. Um, Renata, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, yes. Why is, well, I just want to say thank you to Lee for that. And to Colin had some comments there in the chat about pigments that we might be able to get back to. But the question, Renata, was why is the art world not sustainable? The art world? The art industry, the, the <clears throat> art infrastructure, the, the world that we, we inhabit. I, I think the art industry is not sustainable because it is built upon exploitation. The art industry has duplicated and wholly adopted the um, so-called free market structure, which is a you know capitalist construct. You know I'm all for capitalism. You know make money if you can do so ethically, but unfortunately. Um, here in the Western world and elsewhere, uh, there's a, a lot of oppression and exploitation um, that is built into, baked in and perpetuated by the art world, um, Africa in particular, and, and um, Asia as well, um, have been uh, exploited. Um, they... Um, Antiquities market has looted and misappropriated artworks uh, that belong to other cultures. Um, art has been a part of the spoils of war, as we see with what happened to um, in, in Nazi Germany, the way the uh, artwork that belonged to Jews were stolen and um, hoarded and traded on the black market. Um, African masks were used to uh, develop the Cubist movement and Picasso got all the credit, um, he, he and his cohorts. So there is a narrative of the Western world in which um, it's, uh, it's based on an either or dichotomy. It does not embrace. It's like either the uh, Caucasians win or the um, Africans in the African diaspora and the Asians win. When in actuality, art should belong to the whole world. It, it should be inclusive. It should be the art of the West and the art of Africa and the art of Asia. And, you know, the art of the world and uh, the gain should not be predicated upon the denigration of the culture that the artwork has been derived from. You know, Africa is put down, put down, put down. Um, black is awful, evil, poor, wicked, uh, and white is good, rich, whatever. And we see that spilling over into politics here in the United States. And it's, it's really uh, unfortunate. 
but such behavior is not sustainable. Prolonged inequality and oppression are not sustainable because you cannot sequester um, greed. You cannot sequester uh, wickedness. You cannot say, well, I'm going to rob from, you know, I'm going to rob Africa of its gold and silver and its art and um, not have that desire to steal then spill over into how you're going to treat your own people. We see that here in the United States with the way women, you know, even white women are being uh, abused and mistreated by the law, you know, uh, where you can't even control what you do with your own body and fertility issues are basically on an auction block here in the United States at the behest of the patriarchy. You know, all this may sound radical, but it's not. It's a fact of life. It's what's going on. And when these things happen, you know, you start devouring your own people uh, that are suppo you're supposed to be for, you know, even though you're working from an unequal construct, the people who are with you on your scale of inequality, when you start abusing them as well, um, what's going to be left? Do you want the whole world to be at the uh, behest of a handful of people? Well, that's not going to work because the numbers just won't match up. We're at a point now here in the West where by the year 2030, you know, and this is something the financiers and big banks are very much aware of, by the year 2030, which is, you know, scant six years from now, you're going to have one out of every two workers here in the United States are going to come from where? Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, so now how is... Um, cutting off aid to Africa and doing everything that you can to uh, make sure that children die young in Africa um, and making sure that you create immigration laws that are contrary to their admission to the United States. How is this going to help you in the long run when in reality you don't have enough people that you consider desirable to man the jobs that are going to keep the country going. We need these workers, you know, and all the activity that's going on right now to stop people of color from coming into the United States. Uh, it's it's a, a sound and fury signifying nothing. Um, so sustainability is by definition um, a system that grows and ideally, it should grow in a positive direction. To create a system that grows in a negative direction that is built on oppression and thievery, you know, um, does not grow in a way that benefits the world. And eventually, it is those things which benefit the world most that are most uh, long lasting, you know. Um, Fascism, neo-Nazism and all that, those things did not work. The American Confederacy did not work because it was, a, it was bad government and it was bad ethics. And it, and it was bad business, you know, because business is built on the invisible hand, you know, the principle of the invisible hand. And people who try to stop the invisible hand will not succeed. And when I say the invisible hand, um, it is that part of business which you must do to help other people to love your neighbor as yourself in order to succeed. I'll give you an example. You might have um, uh, a deli owner who is in a uh, Muslim neighborhood, Jewish neighborhood. And the deli owner could be a white gentleman who does not like um, he doesn't care for Muslims and he doesn't care for Jews or black people, but because he has a deli in a neighborhood where people have certain color, um, culinary and dietary laws, he's going to have to abide by that. Okay. Um, these, the people that he serves will not patronize his deli if he does not 
comply with, say, uh, kosher um, rules. If he does not handle his meat according to halal uh, regulations, if he keeps a deli that is filthy and fly ridden, he may consider his customers to be insects, but he cannot have insects in his business and expect to earn a living. So in order to succeed and make sales where he is, he's going to have to maintain a certain sanitation level, a certain regard for the dietary laws of the people that he serves. And so people who are running the art market right now they're functioning as if they don't have to pay attention to the invisible hand, okay? They can just plunder and loot and steal and rob and misappropriate and uh, distort and oppress infinitely. It doesn't happen. It's not sustainable. You really, the golden rule is best. You love your neighbor as yourself, you know? If you don't do that, then, you know, look forward to the time when you will no longer be in business. You know, because like I said, the Confederacy, the American South fell for a reason. It was bad ethics, slavery's bad ethics. It was bad business. The plantation just took and took and took and took. Plantation system gave nothing back. It robbed the land. It robbed the people. Unsustainable. And it was bad government. And that is why they lost the Civil War. And... It'll be the same underlying principle that is responsible for the fall of the mega art world and the large museums if they don't pay attention to what they're doing. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bernada. The mention of inclusivity reminds me of how that's one of the tenets that we have in our manifesto. I'm sure everybody here is happy to you know, be part of something that's like that. I'm wondering if there are any questions for any of our presenters. I just wanted to say one thing and jump in as part of um, this group and you know, in terms of helping to formulate um, the community and stuff like that, I think you know, we all collectively have an opportunity to make change by exerting, you know, and um, embracing curatorial decisions that are overtly inclusive. Um, trying, you know, with the Southampton show, I did my best to try to make it as gender equal as possible and, you know, as diverse as possible, even though um, inherently, um, just look at the people in this room. You know what I mean? So it's not something that just happens automatically you know it's something that happens through conscious choice and effort um and i think that you know um hopefully that's something that we can all sort of make happen or at least move in that general direction so that's my spiel thank you colin cynthia you have your hand up Yes, uh, following uh, Colin's remarks and Renata's remarks, which certainly get at the issues about artists, I think, uh, unfortunately, many artists are not respected uh, regarding the value of their work. And I think this starts with education. Uh, schools do not all have art programs, nor do they want to support them. Or do they understand that the creative act is embedded in art and then can open up into other areas of life that are so important that to create is a, a, a human skill that can transform the world. And unfortunately, on schools do not do enough worldwide now, this is not to say there aren't schools that do embed art programs, but I think to put everything on an equal plane globally, that, that attention to art is extremely important and it should be one of the subjects that is paid attention to. You hear a lot about STEM programs that are science, uh, technology, engineering, and math. Well, there's also the STEAM program that includes art 
And I think that is something that has to be uh, nurtured uh, because in order to respect artists, you have to understand that art is important and it is valuable and it has some important role in the world today. That's my spiel. Thanks very much, Cynthia. Um, a, oh, yeah, go ahead. There, I see Stephen has his hand up. Uh, can you hear me? I've got a yes. new, okay. I have new earphones. Um, thank you. Um, I've not been to this group except once before, so I might be off base, but uh, I just want to say that um, one of the things that makes art unsustainable is when we, my thought anyway, is that we focus so much on the artifact and not on the process that gets us there. What I mean by that is if we focus so much on product and the demand of the market, we might sacrifice the ideas that normally flow through artists to generate that. So now we start replicating something that has already been done. The replication eventually wears out. Um, I had an art history professor who told me once that art history is about the stories of the work and the artists. It's not about what you see on the wall. Everything on the wall is the residue from the art process. And I'm thinking that maybe that's where we are. And it certainly isn't this group because we're pushing on things <laughs> that aren't even there yet. <laughs> so our ideas are fresh, but that's not necessarily true of the, the market that might see that might see all of the market and the and the glut of the market as a bellwether that things are falling apart and i and i don't know what that all means so i'll just lower my hand now thank thank you very much stephen michael price hi yeah so for 30 years i was paid for my creativity and that creativity was bent to product. And I think that's where we are on all of this is that there are markets for product. And so there is no pure creativity market. There's no art market for creating art. It's, it's for creating product. And that's the issue is that we subvert creativity through education to be worker bees, to fit, you know, fit in here, there. And if you look at the history of most of the tech expressionist artists is we've survived by creating product. Um, and it's only when we get to be older or we get some independence that we can use our creativity in the way that we really absolutely have always wanted to be able to do. And so, all, all the creative avenues are hit driven industries where, you know, big names make all the money and then you have all the tiers below it that never make any money. And most of us are in those areas where we're trying to survive because we're not big name people. And, and so therefore all the abuse that Renata or yeah, that Vernada was talking about and the exploitation happens so much because um, it can be, because if, if you're not willing to do whatever it is, uh, there are you know, multiple people behind you who are willing to put up with uh, terrible working conditions and, and things of that nature. So yeah, I, I, I submit that if there were legitimate markets for creativity, that were based not on an end product, then artists could survive. Um, and maybe someday we'll get there. I, I'm not seeing it. Thank you very much. We have oh. Cynthia Beth Rubin next, Hi. and then Roz has her hand up after Cynthia. Hi, uh, so um, this is a great discussion. And I, I really wanna thank um, Vernada for her summary of giving us perspective about 
the international, the world and cultural hierarchy, because I think that's really important to consider. Um, those of us who kind of escaped in a way um, into academia as a way to earn our living. <laughs> um, and so I supported myself through teaching and um, that allowed me to avoid thinking about the art market and to concentrate more on what I call reputation building. And I actually have earned more money over the course of my life by being invited to give talks, um, being, you know, many people know I was flown to Japan for many years to jury something. And in that arena, I think that there's a little bit more flexibility, but still it's an ongoing struggle. And I, I am so thankful to, to expressionists because I think just having these salons and trying to find a way, we've been over here on the side trying, struggling with the automatic translation, which isn't working the way we want it to yet, but it will, it will. Um, and, um, if you saw me looking up, it was because I was translating on the side and pasting it into the chat. Um, so that's all I wanna say. I wanna thank, thank everyone in this group. Thank you for uh, your observations. And I think we can make a joint commitment to try to move forward together um, even in little ways, because every little bit is important. Okay. So. Thank you, Cynthia, Roz, and then Susan. And then I think we're coming close to 135 or so. Is that right, Colin? Yeah, I, I know we are getting really close here. I'll, I'll make this quick, which I've been doing the whole time. But um, I just want to recommend a book. I may have brought this up before. Um, as most people here know, I'm a spiritual person, interfaith ministry, and also art. It's always been all combined. But there's a book by Lewis Hyde called The Gift. And it's an interesting book. And primarily for me, there were a few pages where in the beginning where it talked about the fact that you know, in the early days of exchange and bartering, which is something you can still find, I think, in some countries like Africa, where you trade three beautiful tomatoes for two bananas, or, you know, th there's a there's a real value, like when we exchange work with each other, there's a real value in that. And one problem, getting back to the whole money thing that we have here in the United States, is when money loses its value, and the only thing that people ask you about your work is, what, how much did you sell it for? Then we've got really, it's no longer about uh, anybody understanding. And this is, yes, education, which Cynthia brought up, huge problem. Um, it's no longer about understanding what goes, uh, what makes, I'm I'm actually still very for product in some ways, because, uh, you know, I don't know, it's a way for people to see what you're doing. Um, but uh, but I, I do think that whole thing of thinking about what value is, because when everybody says, oh, and did you sell, see how much they sold this for? You know, it's lost its meaningfulness. And when when a, when an industry loses its meaningfulness, I mean, young people I've met for years have said, oh, art, it's like, what a joke. And yet it's the new, of course, you know, visualization of the world and lingua franca. So uh, anyway, I think we're witnessing to that with this group where, you know, an image is a million images, which is what my new works are. And other people are doing that too. But I, I do still think there is a, a meaningfulness to be sad about this, but we're, we are in a huge paradigm shift. Thank you, Rose. And finally, Susan. Um, well, it's it's interesting because when people are talking about uh, sus being sustainable as an artist, just witness the list of things that I have done throughout my life as an artist. Uh, because I didn't, I wasn't a professor. I didn't have a regular income, and so I was constantly, and still now, constantly seeking ways to support the fact that I'm an artist. So I feel like I've lived the life of someone that's what we're talking about. I've lived that life. I'm still living that life. Um, but, um, and I also want to bring to note that my perspective on the art world is flavored enormously uh, by the fact that I live in Eugene, Oregon, where there's a constant effort to locally to push the arts uh, and culture and to claim a place at the table. There are organizations here, the city of Eugene. It's a different, I have, I, from here and my looking into my city, it's a different, it's a climate where there 
are people that recognize and push art a lot in our local community and also pay attention to the history and inclusion. So I am I'm witnessing that, but still there are some places in the community that follow um, the patriarchal histories, but the because I live in this sort of, this town, not that it doesn't have other elements, I see that and I'm just saying, I'm witnessing it in my own town, the effect of um, the shift in the view of, of uh, using histor uh, historically marginalized people, using that language. And um, I enjoy that, I'm just saying I enjoy it, but it hasn't pr provided me the income that, was, um, that would have made me more comfortable. It hasn't provided me with that. So my dichotomy, thank you. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to all of the artists who participated today and who spoke. It's been a really great discussion and I look forward to salon number 81. All right, uh, thank you so much Renata for, um, for moderating and to all the presenters and everyone who's in attendance. Um, this will be published to YouTube at some point relatively soon. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have a tradition here um, called the after party, which is essentially the advisory board. Um, so anybody who wants to hang out afterwards is going to be the um, board of advisors that makes the decisions for the topic of the next salon and discuss any initiatives we have going on right now, which there's a couple. So um, with that, I'm going to close out the recording and anyone who wants to hang out afterwards, um, you're more than welcome to attend and just uh, stick around. So we will um, be stopping this recording in three, two, one, and come.